welcome you on behalf of the Russian Area Studies Concentration and the Department of Theology and Religious Studies here at Villanova. Uh, we gathered this afternoon to welcome uh, our guest speaker, Father Leo Walsh, Associate Director, Secretariat for the Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs Office for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Father Walsh, in his uh, dossier, holds degrees from Notre Dame, from the Pontifical North American College in Rome, and from the Angelicum, also known as the University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Urbany. Father Walsh is here to share out of his expertise in ecumenical and interreligious affairs to talk about the uh, church relations in Russia. I am sure that you will um, give him his, your best attention and not only to, to learn but just to enjoy his company because that comes so naturally whenever he enters a room. So thank you, Father Leo, and I turn it over to you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, a lot of people, my niece, who is a psychologist, um, and has her doctor, her name is actually Rebecca Love. I told her she can never get her doctorate because you can't go to a psychologist named Dr. Love. <laughs> she loved this initial. She's like, yee, 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 you know. You know. Of course, I got, the, I got the, it's an academic credential. It means doctorate in sacred theology. And uh, I got the t-shirt that says, my bishop sent me to Rome, and all I got was this lousy STD. <laughs> He won't wear it, and I don't know why. <laughs> so, Doctor in Sacred Theology. So, anyway, today what we're going to talk about is <clears throat> the what we call lost in translation, divergent notions of religious liberty in post-Soviet Russia. Kind of what went on after the fall of the Soviet Union. What was the um, circumstances in which the Catholic Church found itself that had been in Russia for over 500 years at that time, as well as the Russian Orthodox. How did things play out? And so we'll look at one particular circumstance. So what I'll talk about very briefly is the, what we call Encounter in Magadan. A, and you'll find out where that is. You'll get a geography lesson. I'll talk a little bit about proselytism, what it is, the best kind and how to do it. No. How to avoid it, it's a bad thing. And, but how it reared its head in the circumstances. So what were the circumstances that gave rise to the study? And then we'll look a little bit at religious liberty in the West. Um, something you should probably be familiar with and know intuitively. I'll help you put some categories to it, learn where it came from. We're going to spend most of our time on the Russian concept of religious liberty, which we'll find is very different. Um, we'll look at its historical development. We'll look at how it found its way into different um, legal documents. Also how it found itself into some church documents. And this, we'll explore this idea of canonical territory, because that's what really uh, is very endemic in the Russian Orthodox understanding of ecclesiological, how the church is made up. And we'll talk about what's emerging in Russia these days. So first, can anybody tell me who Louis de Leon is? The room's named after him. It's right back there. Learn it. You get extra credit from Father Loya. Okay, first, what Father did not mention is I'm a priest. I am a priest of the Archdiocese of Anchorage, Alaska. I was born in Anchorage, Alaska. And yes, you can see Russia from there. What you see here is the Bering Strait. This is Little Diomede Island. That's the United States of America. That's Big Diomede Island. It's Russia. They're three miles apart. So yes, you can see Russia from there. And why becomes important later on. Uh, to give you an idea of the geography that we're talking about, Big Diomede and Little Diomede are right in there. Anchorage is right here. The Archdiocese of Anchorage actually covers all this area here. I spent two summers on this island here. You can see you're actually closer to Russia than you are to the United States. Magadan, the town we're going to talk about, is right up here. It was the center of the Gulag Archipelago. How many of you have read Walter Chizik's With God in Russia? Great book. you got to read this book. This, you know, if you think there are no, you have to, have to be real wimpy to be a saint, Walter Chizik. He was outrageous. 27 years in the camps, and that was where it started. So, from Anchorage, Alaska, to Magadan, Russia. 
So what happened? Well, let's talk about the encounter in Maginot. I'll give you the cliff note version of this. Um, if you got the paper, then you know it a little bit. In 1989, Francis D. Hurley, the Archbishop of Anchorage, made three trips to Russia. And he went over to the town of Magadan, and among other places, and he found two kinds of people there. The first, he found Roman Catholics who had been underground and who had either been displaced in the Stalinist Persians. Because remember, Magadan was a Soviet city. It was built by Stalin in the 30s. It was a processing point for all the political prisoners. It was a state city, in fact, built on the bones of the people who built it. Um, hundreds of thousands of people died there. Hundreds of people were deported. So Latvians, Lithuanians, Poles, uh, Volga Deutsch, they all found their way out. And he found them. And they said, we're here. He went over as a sociologist. In fact, before we sent him over, we blacked out his, the white on his uh, passport photo. So that, because uh, we didn't know. It was Soviet Russia at the time, run by the communists. And he found people like uh, Olga here. And marvelous, marvelous. And she's got a great story. She's a survivor of the camp. She saw all of her family killed. Um, and they said, we're here. So, and he also found a real curiosity with the Russian people themselves, just Russian citizens uh, who had no religious vocabulary, no religious context. Our, Archbishop Hurley, being Archbishop Hurley, tried to do two things. For the Catholics, he said, well, let's get a parish going. You know, and they registered a parish, and it still is in existence to this day, or Lady of the Nativity Parish. Father Mike Shields, a priest of our diocese, is the pastor there. And for the for the regular, you know, for the Russian citizenry, people who are curious, as one fellow said, I, you know, I believe, but I don't know how to say what I believe. And he says, I want my son to see what you do. He thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could have an ecumenical center for culture and religion? And, you know, this center would be uh, a provide a place for people in Magadan to explore their intellectual and spiritual curiosity about religion would undoubtedly provide a unique forum for dialogue between members of different religious heritage, especially between Russians and Catholics. And perhaps more importantly, it provided an opportunity to start the dialogue from scratch. Because any of you that have studied this know what was going on on the other side of Russia with the Ukrainians, and as they were trying to reclaim a lot of tensions, uh, in a region untouched by historical prejudice, it could provide a much needed counterexample to the situation in Eastern Europe and with Catholics and Orthodox working together in an atmosphere of filial charity. The Russian Orthodox went ballistic. They accused Hurley of proselytism. They accused him of setting up jurisdiction. They accused him of all sorts of mean and nasty things. In fact, uh, Archbishop Carroll, the head of external affairs, that may, name might sound familiar to you, he's now Patriarch Carroll, wrote and uh, you know, wrote Archbishop Hurley and said that the proposed center in Maginan is one of the stumbling blocks in carrying out a brotherly dialogue between the Orth Russian Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. I jokingly say that Francis D. Hurley single-handedly brought to a halt the Russian Orthodox dialogue. It's not entirely true, but certainly on the eastern part of the country it is. So what could have led to this situation? What were some of the theological, historical, cultural factors which lie behind the negative reactions of the Russian Orthodox leadership? to you know, the establishment of this place. That's what we're going to look at. And the key lies in what I believe is a very different understanding on either side of the Bering Strait, if you will. Notice how my geography is different than yours regarding the theological concept of religious freedom. This is the nut. You know, in the next you know, 35 minutes, we're going to take a look at the concept of religious freedom. We're going to look at proselytism, since that was the original charge. I'll contrast it with notions of religious liberty. And I hope that by understanding the past, we can understand the situation now and help for the future. So let's talk a little bit about proselytism. And over the years, the notion of proselytism has gone from a rather benign term to a pejorative, expletive really, that accuses even as it, as it describes. Uh, this is due to several factors. The first is that in reacting to, re to the religious absolutism of the 14th and 15th centuries, uh, which was perceived to be the cause of a lot of suffering, the Enlightenment philosophers saw proselytism, seeking converts, as a standing in contradiction to the notion of tolerance, even though the notion of tolerance itself is steeped in a brew of moral self-righteousness. Remember, the greatest sin right now is to be insensitive, intolerant. As one lecturer says, tolerance is the proselytism that dare not speak its name. 
Um, secondly, as a result of the integration of enlightenment values into its operative hermeneutic, the way that we interpret things, seeking converts runs afoul of sensitivities of modern society, which is characterized by a celebration of freedom, autonomy, pluralism, and relativism. Finally, while seeking converts plays a role in every religion in modern society, especially Christianity, it's the motivations, the methods, the means of how one goes about such an endeavor that make all the difference. Uh, within their own frame of reference, groups seeking converts may believe that they are acting in the best interests of all involved. However, those groups who do not stop to examine the long-term consequence of their actions may actually end up doing more harm than good. Campus Crusade for Christ gets in a lot of trouble with this. Uh, InterVarsity Fellowship often will be pegged for stuff like that. Um, and motivations based on fear are less admirable and are less credible as they exemplify an unreflected prejudice, which, which is content. You know, it's contrary to the dictates of charity, the means people. And so, knowing that, knowing that, that no one should be forced, and certainly people need to be respected. Um, the idea of proselytism, going in, fishing in your neighbor's pond, if it were, is, is something that we just don't do in the ecumenical world. Um, we respect where people are coming from. And the idea in the ecumenical world is think of the wagon wheel, Christ at the center, and ourselves on the slope, so we get closer to Christ, we get closer to one another. It's a theology of convergence. It's not a you come inism, it's ecumenism. We meet in Christ. So let's talk about religious liberty in the West. Um, some of the early places where it found its, uh, you know, its, its, its initial expression is the Virginia Act for establishing religious freedom in 1876. The current notion of religious liberty is not a new one by modern standards, it's about 200 years old. Uh, the same enlightened philosophy, there's an enlightenment philosopher right there, Thomas Jefferson, uh, in its reaction to abuse and tyrants, the constrictions on liberty established by state churches gave rise to desire for religion, for the exercise of religion, apart from the regulation of the state. And this first written articulation can be found in the early documents of the American Republic. Uh, first, the Virginia Act of Religious Freedom. And it basically said this, that no man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship place or ministry whatsoever, nor shall it be enforced, restrained, molested, or burdened in his body or goods, nor shall otherwise suffer on account of his religious opinions or belief, but that all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinions in matters of religion, and the same shall be no wise diminished and large affect civil authorities. Boy, they spoke wonderfully back then, didn't they? It's neat. But three years later, we get the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, which you probably should have learned by seventh grade, which basically says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, and so forth. So the idea of coercion in religion was not there. Now, to say the least, um, and this found its way in other places, too, in the United States. Um, the idea that church and state occupy two very different roles and therefore two entirely different spheres of influence, while peacefully coexisting, became part and parcel of the American religious experience. It's an interesting article in the New York Times editorial when the United States took over the Philippines in uh, the Spanish-American War, the Vatican set out to set up a concordat, like they did with every country. This was abhorrent to the folks in the New York Times and to all Americans, and this was the typical response. To an American, this is wild and fantastic. What we have to accomplish in the Philippines is by no means a concordat, an agreement with the Vatican. Come on. Direct or indirect, it's a transition from a concordat or any arrangement involving cooperation or even mutual recognition of the church and state, the American system, under which the church and state simply have nothing to do with one another. Now, the Catholic Church, like most of the rest of the world, was not real enthusiastic about the American experiment. Um, if, you, uh, if you see, this was how it was basically, right up until the dawn of the Second Vatican Council, the traditional teaching on the issue of religious liberty could be articulated in the following manner. This is great. This is, this is church speak at its best. There is only one true church or religion. It is the highest good for man. Hence, the state must aid the church positively, defend it from all attacks. This is to say that only the Catholic Church is to have full religious liberty. Point number one. All other so-called religions are in error, and error does not have the right of truth. Error must, be freely must not be freely propagated. The conservative wishes 
to maintain error by legally prohibiting public assemblage or propagation. All right. And third, if the Catholics, this is one I love, the Catholics are in the majority, I, you know, for example, Spain, Colombia, they are to oppose the external and public freedom of those holding different religious beliefs. However, if Catholics are in the majority, they are to ask for religious freedom. See how that works. But this was operative throughout the world, not just in the United States. But the church was not real thrilled with this. However, after the devastation of World War II and the rise of its totalitarian regimes, especially the Soviet Union's the Eastern Bloc, the question of religious liberty took on renewed urgency. This urgency was felt not only within the church, but also in the world in general, as witnessed by the United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights as promulgated in 1948. And said basically in Article 18, everyone has the right to religious freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, in public or in private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Sounds pretty good. It's kind of where we're at. So how did the Catholics, there it is right there. So how did the Catholics, uh, how did we get into this? Well, enter a guy named John Courtney Murray. You want to know how important this guy was? He had his picture on the cover of Time magazine. And he was the one who developed it. And he sought a theology based on natural law. He drew on John of Paris and Leo XIII. And he held that the society, state, and government were three distinct separate realities. The church should have permanent principles, three permanent principles in relation to the state. The needs of freedom, the need for harmony of laws, and the necessity of cooperation. Uh, Murray Quinn also coined four other terms in civil society, four other terms, civil society, the body politic, the state, and government. And basically, he saw civil society as the total complex of organized human relationships in the temporal plane. So, you know, taking care of things that basically need to be taken care of. And then he saw the body politic, which is political side, society aimed at the common good and its functional aspect of society, structures to achieve its goals, bureaucracy. And then, uh, and also the two houses of, you know, the, the structure of government and the state, which is this re reciprocal and government, which is this re reciprocal relationship between the ruler and the rule. So, well, he wasn't really welcomed with open arms. In fact, like our buddy uh, De Leon here, he was uh, censured, but by then his thought was pretty well put together. But he was vindicated at Vatican II and in the, in the uh, Declaration on Religious Liberty, Dignitatis Humanae, and it was adopted, just to let you know, it was adopted by a vote of 2038 to 70. So, when the council fathers talked, they, this is what, this was a big deal and a huge landslide. It was almost unanimous. And there's basically four main principles in the document. There's freedom from coercion. There's religious freedom. Finds its origins in the dignity of the human person. Now you're at a Catholic university, I'm assuming this phrase is just about in everything that you do, right? So religious freedom finds its origins there. The third principle is that this right is not absolute, can be regulated to preserve the public order, and freedom is a protected value in society uh, together with the value of justice. So, so here's a question, how do you preach the gospel without becoming, you know, falling into proselytism, forcing people into it? Um, the council was very wise in this, and they, uh, they pointed out four ways, by prayer, by forming our consciences in the light of the teachings of the church. This is an important one. You are obligated to form your conscience, but in the light of the church. So if you're not sure what the, you know, well, you know, they say, Father, what does the church teach about this? Well, that's one of the ways to form your conscience. Also, if you're smart, you're in a Catholic university, you can look stuff up. Um, a wealth of things to help form your conscience. A lot of people are surprised at what the church actually teaches. By holiness of life, of the evident to all who see you and are thus attracted to the gospel that's lived, and also by engaging the world in a spirit of charity and patient prudence. So, so that's religious liberty in the West, kind of as we understand it. You know, it's, it's pretty basic. You kind of know it intuitively, hopefully, and how we articulate it in the church now, but, and how it's found its way in the legal stuff. 
In contrast to this, let's look at religious liberty in Russia. I chose this slide on purpose. St. Basil's, the Kremlin, church, state. Actually, it's all part of one compound if you've ever been there. Um, perhaps the primary cause of the charges of proselytism labeled at the Catholic Church by the Russian Orthodox is, in, as I think, is that the notion of religious freedom is understood much differently in the Russian context than it is in the West. As we talked about in the first section, you know, in the West, came out of the Enlightenment. In Russia, they didn't have this experience. Um, insulated, basically from the vagaries of the Enlightenment, by and large, uh, their cultural religious development followed a very different path. Therefore, their legal and religious understanding of religious liberty is very, very different. Uh, commenting on the constitution of the emerging Russian Federation, uh, Nicholas Gvozdev from the Brigham, Law, Brigham Young Law Review, he said this, he said, in the United States, he said, in the United States, individual choice has become the benchmark by which the validity of decisions is measured. In contrast, constitutional pr principles in Russia have to be interpreted not only and simply through the prism of the individual, but through the matrix of relationships that create and maintain society. The Constitution of the Russian Federation, probably in 1993, is a mixed document drawing from the Anglo-American, continental European, and Russian constitutional traditions. As such, it presents a collision of cultures. And this is evident in the new constitution, which, uh, oh, there's Kabazdev, sorry, I got a little behind myself. So, um, the collision of cultures is evident in the new constitution, which bears testimony to the struggle of the Russians to define themselves in a way that constructively engage the West, yet stay true to its cultural roots. And such an attempt did not sit well with the Russian patriarch, who during the Constitutional Convention made a vehement protest against the forcing of North American norms of religion on Russia. And furthermore, he said that any legislation should take into consideration the national traditions of Russia. And as Gervazdev points out later on, he says that the very phrasing of these articles couched in Western individualism clashes with deeply rooted historical and constitutional attitudes in Russia itself with regards to how religious freedom is to be understood and applied. Through the agency of the Greek nomocanon, um, ancient Russia was exposed to the idea of religious identity as a hallmark of one's membership in the community and the political state. Therefore, religious freedom in Russia was historically understood in a communal rather than an individual manner. Uh, thus, the concept of the genetic or national believer that people should adhere to religion, to the religious tradition of their family or nation carries a great deal of currency in contemporary post-Soviet Russia. So it's this concept that the genetic or national believer is deeply rooted in the historical experience which gives rise to the current Russian Orthodox understanding and Russian understanding of religious freedom. Let's talk a little bit about the historical development. How did they get there? And this is evident from the first story of the, um, of the of how the ancient Rus embraced orthodoxy, 988. And it can be found in the Chronicles of Bygone Years. You've all heard of Prince Vladimir, I'm assuming, by now. Mm -hmm. And even if the story is mythical in origin, which it probably has a lot of his history in there, it nevertheless served as a powerful blueprint for Russian attitudes of religious freedom in the past millennium. According to the story, in the late 10th century, foreign missionaries began to arrive in Kiev and address themselves to Prince Vladimir. Up to this time, the Russian society was rather informed religiously, and the missionaries hoped to make converts among the peoples. What followed was this test of the faiths. And so Vladimir knew that his decision would affect the whole people. So he wished to test each faith on its own merits. So dismissing all the missionaries, he called a meeting of the elected elders of the city. These were the representative of the assembly, which comprised all the free citizens of the, of the country, which is the landowners, basically. And using this form, any decision made regarding the religion of the people would have legitimacy of the highest authority of the community. So Prince Vladimir summarized for the elders the teachings of the various missionaries. However, the elders wished for a more thorough investigation. They asked the prince that they be allowed to send representatives of the community to various parts of the world and see how other people rendered service to God. And the proposal was acceptable. Bless you. Both the prince and the people. Thus, a commission of ambassadors was elected and sent, and they eventually made their way to Constantinople. And you might remember what they said. We went to Greece, 
And the Greeks led us to the edifices where they worshipped their god, the Hagia Sophia. And we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth, for on earth there is no such splendor or such beauty, and we are at a loss to describe it. We know only that God dwells there among men, and their services are fairer than the ceremonies of all other nations, for we cannot forget the beauty. And so in light of this favorable report, Prince Vladimir asked, and where shall we be baptized? And the assembly gave him authority, and the Russian people embraced Orthodox Christianity of Byzantium. Now, Galazdev will maintain that given the nature of the report and its reception, it's not only tenable, but it's essential to note that the commission was empowered to act for society as a whole and not simply choose a faith for themselves. It's a kind of social contract which binds all succeeding generations. And so to be Russian, therefore, was to be an Orthodox Christian. It was an integral part of one's membership in the community, not subject to individual choice. Such attitudes, as we'll see, remain very strong even today. Now this didn't mean, this didn't mean that, um, you know, that the, within the borders of Russia that everybody had to be Orthodox. Actually, to the contrary, medieval Russia saw itself as a very religiously tolerant society. However, in such a society, religious liberty was understood as the right of other nationalities resident within Russia to maintain their own distinctive social contract. And in the city-state Republic of Novgorod, as well as other communities in northern Russia, religious minorities were organized as parish communities with distinct wards, governed by their own officials and own laws. Think Fiddler on the Roof. You've got a pretty good idea of what was going on. You remember that? You know, if you've ever seen the movie, you've got the Russian Orthodox over here, you've got the Jewish community over here, and there wasn't a lot of play between the two, was there? So, um, you know, most official proclamations in the imperial period on religious toleration to non-Orthodox groups, including Muslims, Lutherans, Catholics, and others, were given to ethnic and national communities and citizens throughout the state. However, if one was to leave one group, or say the Polish Catholic became... Uh, wanted to become Orthodox, there was actually an elaborate ritual involving bathing, not necessarily rebaptism, and receiving a new name. And uh, he would effectively die to one community to join another. And Galazdev notes that this communal interpretation of religious expression also strongly influenced the 19th century concepts of dealing with freedom of conscience. And the Slavophiles, those who wanted you know, the Russians to be closer to their Slavic heritage than to their Greek heritage, wrote a letter to the Serbians on how they should, as fellow Orthodox, approach the concept of religious freedom. And do I have that here? <coughs> yeah, that comes later. But he said, let there be everywhere complete freedom of faith in its profession. Let no one endure oppression or persecution concerning matters of religious freedom. Let there be everywhere complete freedom of faith, and let no one, uh, whoops, I skipped myself. That's why a person from a different faith must be like your guest, protected from every injustice, enjoying all your rights in the private life and in public matters. He should be not a full-fledged citizen with the other brothers, however. Passing judgment together with his brothers on public matters. God saved you from the internal dissent. Do not admit to such dissent in the very depths of people's conscience and the public spirit. We think they cannot be offended by such exclusion, as they themselves, out of love for you, would not wish to bring the seeds of discord and dissent to your society. So, you can see how it, how it goes. Um, also, these are the comments of Donald Mackenzie. I'll just read the first part. So it seems to a Russian, in the nature of things, that Tartars should be Mohammedans, Muslims should be Poles, or excuse me, no, Tartars should be Mohammedans, that's Muslims, that Poles, should be Roman Catholics, and the Germans should be Protestants. And the mere act of becoming a Russian subject is not supposed to lay the Tartar, the Pole, the German under any obligation to change his faith. These nationalities are therefore allowed the most perfect freedom and exercise of their respective religions, so long as they refrain from disturbing by propagandism, proselytism, the divinely established order of things. So, that's that right there. Um, so the political, cultural, historical view of religious freedom, which forms the Russian self-awareness, is very different from that which developed in the West. Here it's evident that within the borders of Mother Russia, there is the majority, normative Russian society, which is by definition orthodox. And living within these same borders are particular ethnic and national sub-communities, Muslim, you know, Muslim Tartars, Catholic Poles, 
Lutheran, Germans, etc., each with its own customs of governance and worship, but none of whom enjoy full membership in Russian political or religious society. Catherine Creedy is less charitable in her assessment. She says this. Orthodox belief had become an intrinsic part of what came to be seen as the Russian identity. In order to protect the state, the Orthodox faith had to be protected as well. Being Russian implied being Orthodox. Being non-Orthodox implied that one was not truly Russian, or at least not a good Russian. So if such a sociological archetype towards religious freedom has shaped the Russian political and religious perspective, then it should be easy to find evidence of it in the current literature and Russian jurisprudence, as well as the official documents of the Russian Orthodox Church. We'll zip through these really quickly. You can also see this collision of cultures within Russian political and religious spheres when such deeply embedded cultural mores come to face with the realities of a modern, secular Russian state by trying to find its place in a rapidly shrinking world, which is typified, among other things, by pluralistic religious ethos. So for our purposes, I'm going to look at two legal documents very quickly. I actually just sort of mentioned them to you. Um, and then there's the Constitution itself, the 1997 Law on Religious Freedom, and then on the magisterial document, the Patriarchate of Moscow, the basis of the, of the social concept. These are great to look at. Um, whoops, that's Catherine Creedy. So, the Russian Constitution, which was December 12, 1993. These are the sections. And actually, these slides are available to you. If you ask uh, Father Lawyer, he can get them to you, as I'll email them to him after this. So just give me a list, we'll send them out. Uh, if you look at these, and you can read them for yourself, it's interesting to note that these constitutional articles, which talk about religious freedom and various different aspects of it, uh, none of them admit a clear-cut guarantee of religious freedom in the American understanding of the term. You're not going to find it in the Russian Constitution. And there's no explicit provision, explicit provision that guarantees that religions, as corporate institutions, have, automatic, have an automatic right to exist in society to seek out members and to guide the beliefs and actions of their inheritance. They don't get uh, a, here in the United States, Villanova University is a corporate person. It's incorporated, it can own property, not so under the Russian Constitution. Um, also, there was the, the act which came later, which was very much because of the pressure of the Russian Orthodox Church that we talked about before. And in October 1997, after the Patriarch and really leaned on, on Parliament so, and the, the Russian Assembly, and it distinguished between those religions which it declared to have traditionally existed within the Russian Federation, <coughs> namely the Russian Orthodox Church, Judaism, Islam, and Buddhism, uh, is there any missing? Mostly. <laughs> what? Mostly. Yeah, yeah. Certainly the Catholic Church, for our purposes, is not a recognized religion, uh, traditional religion inside Russia. Although, uh, there were four million Roman Catholics of Polish descent put there by Catherine the Great in Siberia in 1917. We can, we have those numbers. So, those that were not held to have any, you know, so made these distinctions, and between those that were, and those that were not held to have any historical connections with the Russian people. And it established two categories of religious organizations. Religious groups, which may exist but remain in an informal private group of citizens, hold no legal status. And religious organizations, which enjoy the status of legal corporation, certain legal rights. Um, and then it describes, this is pretty notorious here, it describes what will happen to those religious groups or organizations which the government feels are a threat. And that one has come back. Enforcement of this law varies largely from recent region to region. Um, and actually, our priest uh, was Michael Shields, who was running, was about to be forced out of the country because they claimed he was not a Russian national. And as this whole wave of Russian nationals come in, he actually sued in Russian court, and he won. He got to remain. But they were ready to force him out, liquidate the church, because uh, one of the local authorities said, hey, you know, we don't like you. Um, actually, it was the Russian Orthodox, because you have to understand he's a very charismatic guy. And, uh, and the Orthodox said, no, they do a lot of good here. Let them stay. And that's really what helped us out. But this practice of 
broad westernizing gestures followed by subsequent backpedaling to native soil is an established pattern in Russia's political and religious history, dating back even before Peter the Great. It's the Russian thing, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have religious freedom, uh, but we don't like everything that showed up at the doorstep, so we're gonna we're gonna back off. And this is pretty typical. So if you're gonna deal with Russia, understand that. The other thing was this basis of the social concept. When it comes to the tension between the historical and cultural Russian archetypes, Western notions of religious freedom, the Russian Orthodox Church comes firmly down on the side of the former. In the year 2000, the Senate, Holy Senate of the Russian Orthodox Church got together and they came up with magisterial documents for the first time in their history. And one of these is how do we engage society? And so um, they come down very much in traditional uh, categories. And the concept of a nation is defined in the document is also very telling. It talks about a national Christian culture, and when a nation or civil or ethnic presents fully, represents fully or predominantly a monoconfessional orthodox community, it can in a certain sense be regarded as the one community of faith, an orthodox nation. You see, and this was in the year 2000 uh, when they put this together. It's Article uh, 1.4. And the traditional Russian model is also invoked regarding direct relations with the state. Uh, that just the notion of symphony between the church and the state is held as the ideal, where the church has its area of influence, the state has its area of influence, and the two circles sort of overlap. And there's concord and symphony, where the church informs, is the conscience of the state, and the state gives certain privileges to the church. So there's an overt rejection of the American model as unfeasible, um, and there's an appeal for special status. So what's notable is not so much what it says, but what it doesn't say. There's no mention of any other religious entity other than the Orthodox Church. And rather than the singular notion of nation, religion, culture rooted in a common ethic, um, you, rather you see a single notion of a nation, religion, culture, um, the traditional notion. So the question is, can such a vision make room for others present within the same, those same borders? You know, the jury's out on that one, folks. It really is. So that brings us into the idea of canonical territory. So if you understand the Russian Orthodox notion of religious freedom, you begin to find the key to understanding the Russian Orthodox claims of canonical territory. And this is coupled very closely with their idea of sister churches, which they understand uh, is very differently from the West. They have a very um, romanticized notion of the term, where this is our territory, and you, know, and you can take care of your own here, but don't be crossing that border. And, um, you know, and, and in the West, where the Pope is a patriarch, fine, but we get to take care of our people too. And, um, and so that's, uh, you know, but they, they have a, they, they harken back to the first millennium of Christianity in which they did not participate. So that's an interesting notion. But it is their heritage. You know, for the Russian side, the designation means that the Christian world between Rome and the East is equally divided. So that therefore the concept of canonical territory is justified. Each church, the argument asserts, is permitted to engage in missionary activity only in its territory. In the domain of the other church, one also has the right to exercise pastoral care over the church members of one's own denomination. This is why in Magadan, the Russians had no problem with the <coughs> parish and in fact encouraged a Catholic parish in Magadan, but went ballistic with the Ecumenical Center for Culture and Religion. It fell outside of their operative hermeneutic, their worldview. There was a certain lens which they view religious freedom, and they could understand the church, the parish, in that respect. But the, the center was a complete anomaly. They didn't have a place to put it in their consciousness, if you will. So what we see, and this is wrapping it up, is an emerging relationship between the church and state. Um, there is a changing religious landscape in Russia. Other religions and places are in places where they just weren't before. Because of the Stalinist purges, because you know Catholics ended up in places they never were before, Buddhists ended up in places they never were, Muslims ended up in places they never were before. And an interesting thing is that most Russian Orthodox parishes are outside the borders of the Russian Republic. With the breakup of the Soviet Union, they're all in the satellite republics now. Not all of them, but there are more parishes outside of Russia than inside of Russia. Um, and there's a new social political environment. Uh, the cultural fallout from the interplay between religion and nationalism. Those of you that have studied it know that there's this huge surge of nationalism. 
uh, in post-Soviet Russia. And to be Russian, so one of those, everybody thought, well, to be, Ru or to be Russian is to be Orthodox. And so I got to go get baptized. And we saw all these people getting baptized, and then they just went about their daily business. Um, some, though, some, it's taken root. And, uh, you know, but there, we also saw these new restrictions on foreign religious bodies, um, especially the 1997 law, and issues related to the return of church property confiscated under communism. One of the things I got to do once was almost, was go to Vladivostok and reclaim the Catholic church that was there. It was built in 1921, and there was an apostolic vicariate, like a diocese over there. And so I was going to be part of the delegation that was getting ready to go. We eventually got the church back, but we share it with, a, uh, with the local symphony, because they use it as a concert hall, which they had before. Um, but they're especially in Ukraine, and uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox, what a quagmire that is. And by the way, I can tell you all about that in his very excellent lectures. Um, and there are significant bureaucratic obstacles. So what we see in this emerging relationship is before there were three previous models of church and state relations in Russia. There's the pre-communist model um, where, you know, the imperial period. There was a model under communism, which was repression, Department of State, heavy, heavy control, and under atheistic communism. And then we saw a hope for, but seldom realized model that resembled the relationship would have been something to akin to what you would find in the West. There was this hope that you, they would become kind of like the West. Well, that, there was a large party, too, within the Russian Senate that wanted that. Uh, they did not prevail. So what you see is an emerging fourth model where the state gives, and this was marvelous how Patriarch Alexei did this. It was, a it was an ecclesiological political dance worthy of Baryshnikov, um, where he was able to manipulate the things under his control under great persecution, but it was masterful where we see this emerging fourth model where the state gives practical preference to the church of the majority, namely the Russian Orthodox Church, but without establishing the state church. And the way they do that is because the Russian Orthodox Church has positioned itself as the guardian of Russian culture. And so for cultural reasons, the state can um, give, render lots of aid to the Orthodox Church um, and will be very reticent to do so for others. And in fact, it doesn't exist for others. So basically, in summary, uh, we saw the encounter in Maginot, Hurley going there, this little situation, this parish, the center, one is acceptable, one is not. Why is that? Because of the way that things develop. Now, we talked a little bit about proselytism, why it's a bad thing. Uh, no one should be forced into, or nobody's, you know, we're talking, the you know, so that is convergent. Um, we talked a little bit about how religious liberty developed in the West. It's a notion you should be fairly familiar with. And then we talked a little bit about the Russian concept of religious liberty, this idea of a national believer. And it's a little bit of its historical development, a uh, little reference to the Constitution of the Russian Federation, and the 1997 law, which pulled back from that, and then the basis of the social concept, which uh, where the Russian Orthodox Church articulated a very traditionalist notion of religious freedom. And then that kind of helps us understand this idea of canonical territory. You know, I've got my pond, you've got your pond, and let's not fish in each other's pond. And then this idea of this emerging relationship between the church and the state. And, you know, this has been, um, you know, so it's a very interesting thing. If we look at why we are where we are right now, um, it's easy for us, especially in the West, we always like to assume that everybody thinks like we do. The real, if you ever travel, you learn that that is simply not the case. And especially it's not the case in Russia. So if we try to go into Russia with the same notions, then we're going to run into this, and you have to expect it. Because they didn't have the experience that we had in the West. They've had their own experience, and they're trying to find their way in the world. Basically, the world came to Russia. Russia was not ready for the world, so they had to figure out what does it mean to be Russia in the world today. One of the ways that they found that was to fall back on the notions that had served them well throughout the centuries, and the idea of religious liberty is certainly one of those. So it's a still an unresolved question, but uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you, and I hope you've learned a little bit about what, uh, in this very quick romp, and uh, through 
but it's been a pleasure to be with you. And I think we've got some time for questions, Steve. Thank you. Terrific. Geography, history, uh, church politics, constitutional law, uh, all in 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> a rich feast. Thank you, Father Leo. Um, I would like to uh, entertain any uh, follow-up questions, clarifications, um, and uh, comments, personal experiences. Please. <coughs> yeah, I, I have a question. Um, you know, a few months ago in Moscow, there was some uh, ethnic violence and tension between some um, immigrants from the Caucasus and some local Russians. And I, mm -hmm. I've, always, I've thought about it from an ethnic standpoint, but your talk today is making me think a little bit more religious influences there as well. And I was wondering if you knew if the Russian Orthodox Church had anything to say uh, in the aftermath of this which is um, The quick answer to your question is I don't know if the Russian Orthodox Church had anything to say. We're finding a lot of those, especially violent, type of things, uh, tend to have their motivations, as all religious violence does, um, whether it's in Northern Ireland, whether it's in Palestine, whether it's uh, anywhere where people use religion in the name of God, it usually has first and foremost uh, primarily a political motivation wrapped in a religious garment. So uh, that particular situation, I don't know whether the Russian Orthodox Church is as, you know, Bishop Larry would be the one that would mention it. And I haven't read any statement of his that addressed that directly, other than to, you know, abhor violence, mm -hmm. you know, in any form, as you would expect a church to do. So, yeah. Sure. Yes. Um, what is the advantage, or what is the distinction by, of these recognized religions as opposed to the unrecognized religions? Well, very good. Did everybody hear the question? What is the advantage to being a recognized religion as opposed to an unrecognized religion? Basically, you get to own property. You have certain legal protections. If you're Russian Orthodox, you, the Russian Orthodox Church is a juridic person. It can incorporate. It can own property. That property is protected under the laws of the state. Uh, if you're not, say if you're Roman Catholic, if you're Seventh-day Adventist, if you're Lutheran, um, you live a very tenuous existence, even now. Even now, you're kind of there at the mercy of the local magistrate. And if somebody wants to denounce you, and they can prove that you are somehow undermining the good order of things, um, there are laws that can be evoked against you. And so you don't have legal protections if you're not one of those four recognized churches. You know, or four religious, not churches, but religious traditions, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, since the uh, since the uh, Russian Orthodox Church really just has that kind of prime position in Russia, does mm -hmm. the Roman Catholic Church ever find itself um, like working with other unrecognized religions in like you know I guess the best the only way I can say it um, without more thought is just you know in an effort to work towards right. more religious freedom. Right. Um, you know, and the first thing is not the Russian Orthodox against the other Christians. That's a that's kind of a false dichotomy. Or it's taking it a little too extreme. It's not like they want you out, but they they do see for themselves a very privileged place in society and have worked very hard to obtain that because they see it as their national heritage. Um, other churches, you know, we worked when we were looking at the center and other things, and even in charitable works. Um, you know, our like the parish that we have in Magadan, I'll give a very good example. Works very closely with the Russian Orthodox bishop in that town. But one of the things I didn't mention was. When Hurley came in, they were afraid he was setting up territory, so they yanked this little monk out of it, you know, this besotted little monk out of his, uh, he's footnote 84 in chapter 5, by the way. <laughs> Very unfortunate. Prop him up, ordain him bishop, set up this diocese and, and ordain him as Bishop of Magadan, a territory which hadn't existed before, because he wanted to make sure the Catholics weren't setting up territory. They were very scared. Now that's all passed, and we actually have good relations. So with food distribution, um, we have the Daughters of Charity are there, and they work wonderfully with everybody. They work with the Russian Orthodox. There's a Seventh-day Adventist community in that town as well. There's also a, a small Baptist community. Uh, the parish itself has about 250, 300 members. Um, and so they do work together. Um, and it's, uh, it's only if you get somebody, you know, really you only see the problems when somebody ticks somebody off. <laughs> or you might get an overzealous uh, young Orthodox bishop, because what 
remember what uh, what they did in the mid '90s. You know, Alexei had to get out all of the Russian spies, although he himself was got his 30-year pen from the KGB. Um, but you had to in those. You had to collaborate, or you couldn't do anything. So he had to get. So he had all these young bishops in their late 30s, early 40s, being ordained and given, you know, a jurisdiction, especially out throughout Siberia. There were eight different dioceses. The average age was 41. The old guy was 52. You know. Um, so sometimes they would get a little overzealous, but they also, having been formed later, had much larger worldview and were willing to work with the Catholic Church. But the idea is, you know, and it's the principle, the ecumenical principle you're looking for is what's called the Lund principle. It was articulated in Lund, Sweden in 1957. And they said, what we can do together, we should do together except those things we can't do together in conscience. You know, like, for example, uh, Eucharistic sharing and whatnot. We're not there, but we can certainly work together, you know, to feed people. You know, hunger has no religion. You know, so for those kinds of social service things, the things we can do together, we should do together. And you see some of that. You see some of that. Or what you'll also see is coordination of efforts so you're not duplicating things. You know, Catholics, you take care of the food distribution, we'll take care of housing. So that's where you see it. Yeah. Uh, Father, um, you represent the Catholic Church, and you speak well for it. I'd like to just probe your self-critical faculties for a minute, and take the side of the Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. and ask you to comment. At the time that you were in you know, the Far East of Magadan, um, in the Western, more European side of Russia, the, the Rome, the Vatican, set up four dioceses without so much as notifying the Moscow Patriarchate. Yeah. It seemed, to speak for the Moscow Patriarchate, it seemed like, well, here's big, you know, Catholic Church coming in, pulling the china shop. Uh, excuse us for, you know, being a little bit prickly about this and sensitive about that. It, um, am I reading the Orthodox position correctly, do you think? Or something you, you are to a degree, um, because what they the, the Russian criticism was not so much that, and it was act, that's actually a more nuanced position. They had talked about this with the previous patriarch, and kind of set these things up. But when Patriarch Alexei was was uh, came into power, was elected by the Senate, um, they implemented that under his thing. And he said, "Hey, you guys, you didn't talk to me." And in essence, there is a, they see these the four dioceses that were set up over a territory which is one-fifth the land mass of the world um, as, uh, as larger than needs to be uh, for just to take care of your own people. They said, you can take care of your own. We're nervous because these represent, um, these represent missionary intent. Now, before 1917, there were actually six dioceses that covered Russia. So it was kind of the, the Catholic Church was setting up. But it's, uh, it's interesting to see what would have happened. And I think that one of the criticisms was that uh, there was a lack of consultation with the, current, with the patriarch at the time. And I think that's a legitimate excuse. Remember, too, that at the time, Russia, well, there was a very siege mentality, as I said. The you know, world came to Russia, and they were reeling. There were just, there's a, a, a real identity crisis that was going on after communism. And if you know anybody that's been part of a dysfunctional family, it's just not enough to get rid of the dysfunction you have to learn how to function in a healthy way. And they were learning uh, an entire nation of 200 million people is trying to figure this out. And they were looking for who, what does it mean to be Russian? And so at, under that, in, the, in that environment, they were getting assaulted from all sides. And so you saw a real shutdown of missionaries coming in, because a lot of people saw it as mission territory. And it's been a, it's been a Christian country for over a thousand years. And that needs to be respected. So it's, uh, like all things, it's very complicated because there are a lot of other things complicated. Also, he had a Polish Pope. And the Poles and the Russians don't get along. Um, it's interesting. They get along better with the German Pope than they do with the Polish Pope. Uh, the Poles, because the Poles actually were able to occupy Moscow in the 13th century and ruled for 70-some odd years, and named Paul the Usurper. And the Russians. Well, it's very deeply embedded in the Russian consciousness. And they will talk about that like it happened yesterday. The Germans, 
They didn't win. That doesn't matter. That's not embedded in their consciousness. So they don't mind the German Pope. Um, but a Polish Pope was never going to be able to vision Russia. So there was a lot of layers of this. But I think the original the original criticism was like, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the principles that you, you kind of need to keep each other informed whether the opportunity for that to happen was possible because of all these other things that were happening. You know, so, you know, I, on the Catholic side of it, you had the Department of State doing things rather than the, the ecumenical office, uh, which might have taken a more nuanced approach. And, uh, you know, so I think they've had, I think they felt they had to act quickly before the door shut completely and ask for forgiveness rather than permission. I don't really don't know. I like to see that file, but guys at my level don't get to see that file. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it is a good question because, you know, when you're getting hit from all sides, and suddenly the 800 pound gorilla starts setting up jurisdictions, it's, it's a scary deal. And so they, they, they had an obligation, I feel, they probably felt from their side to say something. And I'd say, oh, that's just fine. It's like, hey, whoa, wait a minute, you know? Um, and especially this notion of canonical territory, you know, they could see it, you know, it would be perceived as missionary intent. Although, you know, the church maintained that certainly it isn't. And given the size, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's right. And, and you know, they don't name these dioceses after places out of respect for the church that's already there. It will be, for example, the Catholic Diocese in Moscow is the Diocese of Mary, the Mother of God, in Moscow. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deference to the Russian Orthodox who have, you know, to the, to the Orthodox bishop who's there and uh, saying that we're here, but you know, in this place. They don't name it, so you don't have two bishops of Moscow. That, that would really rub things our own way. Even though in the West, we're very comfortable with overlapping jurisdictions. Yeah. yeah. Um, Father, I'm, I'm having a little bit of difficulty um, wrapping my mind around the way in which the Russian Orthodox look at the relationship between ethnicity and, and religion. Mm -hmm. You made a very compelling argument that for the Russian Orthodox, it is intrinsic to being Russian that you are Russian Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And yet, you gave an interesting example, and I want to follow up on it. What happens if a poll, a Roman Catholic poll, decides to convert, or right. like to convert, to become Orthodox? This could be ma multiplied by examples if a Tatar right. wanted to convert and become sure. Orthodox. Sure. And the, the other way around, if an Orthodox, somebody who's Orthodox, a Russian Orthodox person, mm -hmm. wants to uh, become a Roman Catholic or sure. some other religion, uh, and, and does so, what happens to their ethnicity? Does the Pole cease to be Polish? Yeah. The community becomes Russian Orthodox? Does the, uh, does the Russian who, who, who leaves the church cease to be, be ethnically Russian? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a how very do, compelling. Do you, you can that? see, you can see that, because you, you, hopefully you were able to perceive, you know, the psychological archetype that's in the Russian mindset, you know, which is still very prevalent. It's the one they, they fall back on, you know. If I'm Russian, I'm Orthodox. And if I'm Polish, I should be Catholic. If I'm, and they, they see this. But as you and I both know, the reality on the ground is, is different. So you do have this sort of a clash. Now in the ancient times, there was a, you know, if a Pole wanted to, be, for example, wanted to become Roman Catholic, there was a, or excuse me, if a Pole wanted to become Russian Orthodox, it really, he took on a new name, which is probably a Russian name, and I think he did become Russian. You know, now that's in the ancient, that's in the, the, the imperial days. Um, so the Russians, so with that in mind, in the, you know, so if that's the operative mindset, and the Russian Orthodox Church is very, came down very clearly on the traditionalist model in 2000 as their operative hermeneutic, the way that they interpret things, the lens at which they're going to view the world, um, when if they, they have a real, a real, real hard time with the Russian becoming Catholic or Lutheran, or Seventh-day Adventist, they see it as an abandonment of their heritage. So if I could follow up just a little bit, mm -hmm. the Tatar would then no longer be Tatar, he would actually truly be Russian. Or, um, the, or the Orthodox the person who became, who, who left the church, would cease to be Russian, ethnically. Uh, not legally, but sociologically and psychologically, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think. You know, the, the religious structures are, or the, the legal structures are different now than they were in imperial times. In, peri in imperial times, absolute. You became a good Russian citizen when you were Orthodox. You entered into a whole different community. Uh, nowadays, it's, it's much more nebulous. 
but the psychological models are still there, and the anxiety when that happens is still very much there. And when, for example, in our parish in Magadan, which is you know, the best example I can speak to, if somebody comes to us who is, whose heritage is Russian Orthodox, we'll, you know, we'll make every attempt to send them to the Russian Orthodox. Because that's the last thing you want to do is be accused of proselytism, because that, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a great way to get kicked out of the country. Um, and so you know, we try to respect that, and theologically it makes sense. You know, if your heritage is, is Orthodox, that's where your spiritual home should be. We're not going to look at it in terms of nationalists as much as, as they do, um, coming from a Western mindset, but uh, you have to respect that they certainly see it that way. And so, Rus so Russian citizens, if you will, that have no religious heritage and have no religious vocabulary, that's a pretty, yeah, that's a very delicate thing. That's a very delicate thing. And there's sort of a grudging, as long, basically, as long as you don't become too big, it's all right. But if we see you're getting too large, then we worry, because that, that, that looks, then it, you know. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's still an unresolved issue. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, that last set of remarks is very mm -hmm. interesting to me. How far do they go? If someone converts from uh, Russian Orthodox to Catholicism or vice versa, mm -hmm. do they change the passport? No, I don't think so. Okay, no, so I don't know how far you no, go. With this. No, no. But remember, there. Remember that there's there's a whole thing about. I mean, what does it mean to be American? For one, I mean, I mean, think about it. What's our cultural identity? I don't know about you, but my cultural heritage was, you know, a bunch of Irish Catholics and my grandfather who. Um, Who's you know who stowed away literally? I can't remember how he did it. He was seven feet tall on a cargo ship. Ended up in New York. Ended up in you know their family ended up in North Dakota. Ended up in Washington. And my dad ended up in Alaska. And that's where I was born. Um, but when I was in grade school, I put on little pilgrim hats, and we were making little things. You know, what does it mean to be American? For a while, you had to be a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male. You know, which meant you had to be industrious. You had to be clean, and you know, all the cultural things that come with that. And a public school system, you know. Uh, the pilgrims weren't part of my ethnic heritage, but they're part of our national identity, if you will. And the same thing with Thomas and the founding fathers and the whole thing. That's very much a part of our national identity that somebody takes on when they come here. You know, and uh, you know, in the public schools, that's one of the reasons you have a Catholic school system in this country. Is we said, okay, we'll be clean, we'll be industrious, we'll fight your wars for you. We're not going to change our religion. And so we're, that's and so we uh, we opened up Catholic schools, Catholic universities, to maintain that part of our identity. Um, but it was it was not always Catholics were not always thought of as good Americans, you know. Um, in fact, the Know Nothing Party and others. So we've all had to, you know, but our you know, so our heritage is, you know. So we eventually took it took us about a hundred years to become good Americans from the European waves of immigration. Now we have a whole other waves of immigration that are learning the same thing. It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. You got time for one more? And what's what's our plan? It's time. Okay. Let's one more. Thank you very much. It is fascinating, and uh, everything you communicated uh, didn't need a translation. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing was lost in translation. <laughs> <laughs>